Hi. Oh, right now? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Howdy. How are you, Facebook? We are live here. Uh, of course, you can interact with us if you would like to share, comment, say what's up. Thomas and Shauna are here from Paradigm Shift Financial. Welcome to the set again. My it's good friends. to be here. It's good to be here. Today we're going to take a, a look at, I mean, one of the things I think that's the most important, I, and I look at this myself as well, I have, I have my own ideas. You guys are, are teaching me a lot of things that I had never thought of before as mm. far as how to organize investments, how to look at the idea of long-term investing. Um, some of the things that you've taught me have been about, you know, why be more conservative as you get older? What sense does that make? Um, especially if you're planning on living a long period of time. <laughs> Why did you <laughs> yeah, want maybe to longer stop than you invested money? in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Also, that it's not not too late um, to invest with that same thought in mind. And a lot of people think they get to 50 years old. Well, oh, that's it now. Mm -hmm. No, yep. no, not if you're living to 80 or 90 years old. Yep. So, a lot of things. T and today, and what, what I love about this is, I've been wanting to sort of do a deeper dive into some of the things we talked about before, diversification. What does that really mean? Asset classes. How do you look these things up? How do you even determine what is a good investment and what isn't? Because if you go onto your brokerage website and start mm -hmm. researching funds, mm -hmm. and you just search by performance, you're going to pull up funds that did really good last year, or the last five years, or whatever it may be. And there's lots of disclaimers that say this is not, you know, future results are not indicative past performance, of past performance yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Uh, and so, h how do you actually take a look at these things? How do you know where to put your money? And how do you know that you are truly diverse in the sense that, you know, all of your portfolio doesn't move in the same direction well, at the same time? Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing that you mentioned, just to expand upon that, is a lot of times people are scared of the market. They're concerned about investing, mainly because th there isn't really clarity for them about what they're doing. Right. I mean, you know, I, I think what I translate to when I think about it is I think about the first time I ever drove a car. Like, that was scary. Because so I'm in this metal death trap. <laughs> and I'm like, which one's the gas? <laughs> you know, so it makes sense that when people don't really have clarity over what's going on, that there's a little bit more fear when things happen because you don't know why it's happening. But our mission and our goal is to have people take their power back by understanding what's going on. Because the more that you understand, the more risk you can take. The more I understand about the markets, the more it's like, oh, okay, we had a correction. Cool, buying opportunity. You know, now it's less fear-based and it's more powerful. And so the tool that we brought today is one of those ways that we help people look at the bigger picture and actually, actually be able to analyze what's going on in their portfolio compared to some academics. Yeah, and that's where I think we align so well together because I believe people deserve to know the truth. Just in general. Mm -hmm. The truth is what I've been looking for my whole life. I know you guys believe the same thing. People deserve to know the truth about money, mm -hmm. how Wall Street works, how these mutual fund companies work, why they're put together, why there's more mutual funds than there are stocks. Right. <laughs> Which mm -hmm. is a, an insane thing if you really think about it. It's, it makes It's a circus. No, yeah, it is. Right. <laughs> that, that's, that's circus. It is. Mm -hmm. That's a circus. So tell us what we're looking at here besides the fact that this is an x-ray of some man's head. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a giant brain. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts off with you need one of these, right? right? And we then do a lobotomy. You, you, the mm -hmm. first thing you need is a brain. <laughs> so our average client has a MRI that would look like this. Uh, <laughs> and the Portfolio idea, MRI, yeah, the that's what we're talking about. The idea, so we didn't go over it in this one, but uh, there's 20 must answer questions that we show, show our clients. And in most instances, they're like, oh man, I only know like three of those, or, or two of those even. And the goal of the MRI, the goal of our teachings, are to get people to slowly be able to transition to yes answers on all those questions. So the reason why we have the brain is because we're actually doing that kind of deep dive analysis on someone's portfolio. Most times when people see an analysis, of their portfolio, it's usually by someone that's trying to sell them a concept. So it's like, oh, here's your breakdown versus here's what you could you could have. And doesn't this pie chart look so much more colorful? Like, I mean, look, I've got this sliver here. You don't even have that sliver, right? Versus looking at, here's what yours breaks down to. And here's, just based on market indexes, here's what that would have done. And by comparison, here's diversification, true diversification, 
And based on market indexes, here's what that would have done. So what do you want your portfolio to look like based on actual indexes? It's a little bit more of a powerful position. Did you just give the whole thing away right no. there? Because <laughs> they don't know which market indexes. <laughs> okay. So you got to pass. And that's important. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, well, cool. Well, let's dive into this. I, it is worth mentioning yeah. that this is an exclusive preview because this is what we charge for. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. This so is, we charge for the guidance that goes along with this, but initially we were charging just uh, to be able to run this analysis for people. Because yeah, so it's not easy. So this is essentially an example of the specific analysis that you would perform on someone's portfolio. Right. Mm -hmm. This is a sample client. Okay, sample client. Yep. Awesome. So like fake, Faker McFakerson. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> we should put the name in. Is that? He, he made that up on the fly. Give him, give him some. Thank you. Jeez. In the car thing. So obviously we blocked out the name, right? <laughs> oh, here we are. Of course. There you guys are. Here we are, and and we'll scroll Make down. Make sure you read those disclosures. <laughs> right, there is disclosures. Make sure you always read all of your paperwork. <laughs> There's some of the notes. Now, so this is what this would be contained. This is a sample of what you would receive. Yep. Essentially, if yep. you had this portfolio MRI right. done. And if you want to, you want to stop here for a second and scroll down to where it says one and two. Mm -hmm. So, the main purpose of the MRI, I'm going to say it because it's like that's that's jargon up there, and I'm going to explain what it means. So the MRI attempts to estimate via broad-based uh, asset category selection the current mix of your portfolio and simulate the historical risk and return. Okay? So the idea is if you believe that you can't predict the market, if you believe that it's impossible to consistently beat the market, then the only alternative if you're going to keep investing is to invest long-term and diversify. So what we'll be looking at when we do the analysis is, if you believe that, which if you're working with us, you should, we're going to look at what is your current mix of holdings for that long period of time and project it out. And deeper than that, we're going to look at what's the return, expected return based on market indexes compared to the risk. Because the whole point of diversification, and we'll get a little deeper in this, but the whole point of diversification is to either get the you get a higher return for the risk you're willing to take or to get the same return and reduce the risk has to be one or the other but you mm -hmm. have to actually know what the risk is scientifically that you're taking and most people don't they just see a mutual fund that has a uh, year to date return or an inception to date return of 10% and they're like oh man that's awesome but if the risk is measured you know we measure the risk and it's three times what you need to take that's not efficient is it right. yeah why do it yeah that doesn't make sense. Risk reward is one of the things I think people don't don't understand um, in general. Right. It is the sort of the, mm -hmm. the backbone of good decision making, and this is why there's so many poor drivers on the road. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you don't understand the simple risk reward analysis of you cutting across those two lanes to get to that exit one <laughs> second sooner. Uh. Right was not worth the risk of your life and all the other people's <laughs> lives. So it's like, that's a, this is a really powerful concept, Yeah, is what I mean. And it's, t it's tough for people to grasp it, but when you talk about risk reward, this is where you essentially make your money. They say, like in yep. real estate, you make your money when you buy the property, mm -hmm. right. not when you sell it, right? Even though you technically don't collect the money until you sell it, but you're making your money because you bought it right. You, what you're saying is you make your money by investing it right using the correct risk reward analysis. Yeah. Like a lot of times people think, well, more risk, more reward. Isn't that <laughs> not true? <laughs> there's, there's, there's prudent risk that you can take, and then there's imprudent, right? Like the example we use in one of the presentations, we have Jim Cramer's face superimposed on a golfer during a, a lightning storm. And it's like, is there risk in using a nine iron that's steel in, uh, in a, in a thunderstorm or yeah. a lightning storm? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, what's the reward? <laughs> a trip to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> if and you have paddles. insurance. <laughs> right. It's like a trip to the hospital, uh, great, right? Okay, cool. So those are the, the two things that sort of explain a little bit about, you know, what it is that you're trying to uh, ultimately accomplish. Yeah, in, so the first one is, the is, yeah, the first one's looking at the current portfolio, like what someone's got currently. And then the second one is comparing it to academically designed portfolio using Nobel Prize winning research that people for you know in our industry conveniently don't talk about. So when we look at the right. objectives here and we're just kind of going through them, this is a sample uh, of what Paradigm Shift Financial, what Thomas and Chana 
are able to create for anyone who has a portfolio to, to, re to be reviewed. Yep. And this is just a sample of one of those, so it would contain this within there too if you chose to, got, to get this done. Now, this is a question I have about objectives. So there's conservative, moderate, growth oriented. Um, is this personal preference? Is it just is it more of about your tolerance mm -hmm. men mentally to try to keep yourself balanced and stick with something like okay I know I could if I I say I want growth but I'm super risk averse I'll freak out the first time the market mm -hmm. goes down is that what you're trying to determine there if you want to explain that well one? we can educate people as much as possible and there's still going to be a certain amount of volatility that they can stomach even if they understand diversification and that the markets are going to move and we can keep them disciplined, which we will, because that's our job, there's still a certain amount that's not gonna meet their sleep factor. That's just the way it is. Okay, so this is this is a personal preference thing. Yeah. Well, and usually, given, like, again, the driving example, usually people who, when, when we don't have clarity, we don't know what the markets are gonna do, we don't understand the academics, they tend towards more conservative. And as they learn those things, as they start to have the ahas of realizing that there's actual science that goes into investing, we've noticed the trend where they start to shift towards more aggressive. I mean, we've got you know, 60, 70 year olds that are, that are relatively aggressive because they're starting to understand that, it's, that there isn't, it's just not like magic that these returns occur and that there's 100, you know, 100 years of data on these marketplaces and that markets tend to be similar across the world. So like the academics of the US market apply to the German market and apply to the Malaysian, like it, it's crazy how that operates. And when you start to get that, it starts to become less scary. Gotcha, and that's a lot, a lot of what it's about is the understanding of that risk reward. Yep. Once you start to understand that, then you mm -hmm. go, okay, from growth, we wanna, I wanna be aggressive now that mm -hmm. I understand how this works because I know that's where I'll get my best long-term returns. Right. Okay, cool. The other reason we have that uh, chart there that shows the you know conservative, moderate, growth, aggressive is because those are, again, the academic designs. And a lot of people don't understand, don't realize where their portfolio falls compared to that. Like we've had people that have said like, well, I, I wanna be conservative. I'm pretty sure my portfolio is conservative. And when we show them what we're about to show you guys and it's like 90% in stocks and they didn't yeah. realize it. Well, so wh what do you think about, or how do you feel about the fact that you thought it was this and it actually is this? And they're like, <laughs> but I told the guy I was conservative. That was yeah, that was the best one. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, Did you? Well, I can't. I can't wait to dive into this because uh, I'm so curious to see not only just what's in this portfolio. It's always interesting to look at other people's portfolio. Like that must be the most interesting part of your job. Is mm -hmm. like okay, let's yep. let's unwrap this and see you know what's in here. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, d I imagine occasionally you come across someone who who d has a pretty well set up and like oh okay hey. It seems to be. I know you're trying to set yourself up that way. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, Derek. No. <laughs> it's uh, it's actually very rare that we find someone whose portfolio follows academic theory. Mm. Very rare. Very rare. We'll show you why as we walk through because there's some very specific pieces. And it was unintentional if it ended up being that way in the rare occasion. Asset class performance. So this is this tells you about the simulated performance. So it's based on past information and then projecting that out. Right? Well, using the indices, right? Yeah. So if you want to stop right there, right? So this is broken down into three categories. Again, broad-based asset categories. So every every one of our holdings will fit into something, whether it's fixed income, U.S. equities, or international equities. So we start with the fixed income, and this is basically how we walk a client through it, is you can understand where your portfolio lies based on the amount of fixed income. As far as where it sits, because if you look to the right, so the sample client mix that's in the green, that's what a client's portfolio looks like. Okay. To the right, the conservative, moderate, growth, aggressive, those are the academically designed strategies that are the ones we're, we're comparing against. So you can see how what aggressive model you should be comparing against based on that subtotal fixed income. So this particular person, when we walked through this, because it's very similar to an actual portfolio, they thought that they were conservative. And gotcha. so when we point that out, now again, a learning opportunity, right, where we can walk a client through so that they can understand this versus us just telling them. So, okay, well, when you look at the subtotal fixed income, 
where do you actually see yourself falling? And they go, oh, well, I'm actually between the growth and the aggressive. Gotcha. So is that what your intent was when you created this? Well, no. Like right there, you're already more powerful. Right? You know what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about diversification, right? What do you think, what do most people understand diversification to be? Like what do you think is the common like layman's term answer we get about diversification? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Bingo. That's what we always get. Every time. Every time. Mm -hmm. Every time. And it's a, it's a great way to understand it and it's you know, like you want a party trick to have some fun? Here's a better way. <laughs> so I'm going to go into the academics very briefly. So the, the, the academics are, um, it's been recorded in academics and with Nobel Prize winning data that when you have certain markets, like let's say I've got U.S. large stocks and then I've got U.S. small stocks, they have their own risk return. When I add them together, in a lot of instances, proper diversification reduces the risk and either keeps the return the same or increases the return for the same amount of risk. So when you're diversifying, what you're really trying to do is add something to your portfolio that's increasing the return or decreasing the risk. So when we understand it from that perspective, is it possible to add something that's going to do the opposite? That's going to actually increase the risk and decrease the return? Sure. Has to be. Yeah. So uh, when you look at um, long-term bonds, for example, you'll notice that all of the academically designed strategies have none. Interesting. And it's because long-term bonds have similar movements of volatility. Yeah, similar risk. Mm -hmm. To stock markets, especially large stock markets. But their return is capped. And the return is historically low by comparison to markets. So if I'm going to take that risk, why not just have stocks? Yeah. So the real way to understand it is it's not don't have all your eggs in one basket. It's find a super quality basket and don't have crappy eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Get a better basket, <laughs> better eggs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now this is so this is this is a huge takeaway right here. Is you're saying long-term bonds ix nay. Mm -hmm. They don't make sense. They don't. Just from a long, like a, a whole market historical perspective, their risk is too high, their return is too low. Their, since their risk is similar to stocks, but their return is way lower, if you're willing to take the risk of long term bonds, you should be in stocks. Wow, that's a big takeaway right there. I can, there's probably a lot of people uh, who have long term bonds out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the fluctuation, like long term bonds. Bond mutual funds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, there are, those are all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's hundreds, of, probably thousands of those. Yep. Just nothing but bonds P just piled into a mutual fund. Oh, we've seen them. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, my bond return, my yeah. bond portfolio is doing uh, great. Well, well, let's take a look at why that is. Oh, because you have long-term junk bonds. Okay. Long-term junk bonds. Man, I mean, what, you could just burn your money, too. That would work <laughs> probably as well with the risk ride you're about to take. <laughs> And if it's in a mutual fund, you know you're paying a whole bunch of fees. For sure. Oh, yeah. Well, some of the fees of these mutual funds are just crazy. But um, crazy. I've only analyzed really like two portfolios other than my own in my entire life, my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff I saw was just bonkers. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, so seriously. You might appreciate the story real quick. So I was, I, I'm staying with Shauna and her husband, okay? And I like kind of fell asleep on the couch the other night. And I woke up to like, not an infomercial, but like a, like it wasn't what I had it on. <laughs> and it was in the middle. I, uh, my spider senses must have been tingling because oh. I woke up and it was this couple talking about, it was, a, it was basically a, a documentary about bad financial advisors. So that's what must have been. I was like, oh, wait, I got to pay attention to this. Um, you subconsciously heard it while yeah. you were sleeping. Mm. And there's this, couple, yeah. <laughs> there was this couple talking about a Merrill Lynch advisor that convinced them to put all of their money into Puerto Rican bonds. And then subsequently... Ooh. Puerto Rican bonds went, and they lost almost they, all their money. I mean, they didn't go to zero, essentially. And, right. Like, if you, people say, oh, but municipal bonds, they're, they're safe. Well, don't talk to the people of Detroit about that. Like, yeah. You know? What is that, an $80 billion bankruptcy? Yeah. The so city of Detroit, give something or take. like that? <laughs> yeah. To sidetrack, the commercial we were, the other commercial we saw the other day was pitching people to teach them how to find when the price is going to change of a stock. Oh my gosh. And I'm yeah. looking at him going, if you actually knew that, why are you trying to teach people? You Just go and go and do it and that's collect a, that's, the that's, money. 
But yeah, first buyer beware thing about any of these infomercials or these YouTube commercials that you see mm -hmm. with these guys who have Ferraris in their garage. Yep. That's that they probably don't own. Um, <laughs> is that if they just think think this to yourself. If this what this person is saying is true, if they know what they actually know, mm -hmm. would it be smarter for them to just do it or to spend money marketing it to you, spend their time trying to yep. explain it why you should buy it from them? Right. Which one would be the thing that makes them the most money? Yep. Yeah. I don't believe in this so I love giving back thing. That's just not what those guys are. It's like if you do power. start a charity. By yeah. giving back, I mean collecting your money. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. if you really want to give back, run that strategy uh, into the ground, make hundreds of millions of dollars and give it away to yeah. all the great organizations. It just doesn't make any sense. So I, I can definitely um, understand where you're coming from there. So we looked at fixed income and the big takeaway is long-term bonds are not worth the risk, academically speaking. And now nope. we can take a look at U.S. equity. Yep. And following, you know, the, again, the logic of diversification, right? Don't have crappy eggs. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, just take, so again, this portfolio is most closely related to the growth portfolio, right? Which is that third column. I mean, this is and this is what we commonly find there. Mm -hmm. Like, look at uh, the green column compared to the third wow. blue. And is this now this sample client? We haven't seen their portfolio, mm -hmm. right? So we don't know what kind of stocks they have, or if they have mutual funds, right. which own the stocks. But this is essentially underneath what they think they own. Right. This is what it is. Well, right. and a lot of people buy mutual funds based on the name of the mutual fund, but the name of the mutual fund doesn't. In, uh, isn't indicative of what the fund actually You mean owns. the 2050 fund doesn't mean if you're retiring in 2050 that <laughs> it's going to be perfectly ready for you no. right at that time? <laughs> <laughs> or even, here's where it gets even worse, uh. like insidious to a certain degree, is like, you know, Fidelity small cap fund, small cap stock fund. You put that into our portfolio analysis and it pulls up mid cap and large cap. But the name of it is small cap. It's because it doesn't have to actually own what the name is. It can change its charter over time and keep the name the same. Or if it owned the same stocks, which it generally doesn't, as those stocks progress and move into those categories, then the fund inherently changes, but the name didn't have to change. So the small cap companies become mid cap, cap or large cap companies, they grow. Yep. Interesting, yep. very interesting. So don't believe the name. It, it, you ha that's why you actually have to do an analysis. You can pick, we have a client who was like, they picked all the small cap funds and their portfolio came out large cap, like most of it was large cap. You actually, wow. you actually delved into it, and most of it was large cap. Crazy. Yep. Wow. All right, so this gives you an idea here, just kind of looking at what the actual percentages would be. And the most aggressive is 50% in total U.S. equities. Yep. So that's the most aggressive academic portfolio mix that you should have. And on the conservative side, 17.5% yep. mm -hmm. should be in U.S. equities. And what's kind of crazy is... Uh, if you look across the board on all of the academically designed ones, they have the least exposure to the one that the sample client has the most exposure to. So each one of them has the least exposure to small, large stocks, where most clients' portfolios have the most exposure to large stocks. And you sit there again and go, very well, why would that be the case? And it's because they have very similar, ri again, it's all about risk return. Large That's stocks right. have similar risk profiles, but smaller expected returns. It's like, and it, that's, that's the academics of it, but here's the anecdotal way to think of it. If I could go back in time, and if I could invest in Apple in 1989, or invest in Apple today, realistically, what's gonna produce more wealth? I don't know if Facebook was ever a small cap stock, but that's the one I still keep kicking myself <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just an example though, right? But I mean, it's like, if you own large stocks, you will <coughs> never own, you'll never have the possibility of owning that the next run. Apple, yeah. the next Netflix. And what happens generally is that you don't own the small company. The small company innovates well enough. The large company is complacent. The small company puts the large company out of business, and then you only buy that company now that it's a large company. So you lost money on the one you owned, and you didn't get the growth of the one that you just bought. Gotcha. That's what happens with indexes too. That's why index funds are, that's the, the negative of an index fund is that you're only owning, especially if it's an S&P index fund, Derek, um, <laughs> is you're only owning those large companies. And as companies come on or companies come off, there's, there's no opportunity to have that diversification there. That makes sense. That actually makes a lot of sense. And the other point to be made there is that if you're a fund oh, manager, what is easier to get into? Is it going to be the large stock or is it going to be the small stock? 
obviously large companies more have more outstanding shares and they trade a lot more often so it's easier for them to get in and out of it that doesn't make it the best for the client though that's true yeah if you look at the average mutual fund the average mutual fund has a 66 percent turnover so what that means is if uh, it's january 1st and i have this basket of stocks it's december 31st 66 percent of those will be different so if that's what they're doing and that's the average mutual fund then it wouldn't behoove them to own small stocks because those are harder to get in and out of. You'd have to own the high volume trading large stocks because if I'm turning over 60% of the portfolio, I need to be able to turn it over. That's right. You got to turn it over because you got to make it look like you're doing something. Yeah. You got to earn that fee. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's crazy. Take, so we looked at US equities. Let's look at international equity here. Yep. And this the sample client is uh, in the green column still. Um, as you can see there, it was very heavy and large uh, large caps or large stocks, large U.S. stocks, and then large international stocks as yep. well, 25%. But we look at the portfolios there between the more conservative, which is on the left side of the blue column, to the most aggressive on the right side of the blue column. And you can kind of see where that lines up. So beyond aggressive Yep. in this case. Yep. Mm -hmm. And most people just don't have um, a lot of international exposure. I mean, most of the portfolios look like that, where it's really heavily weighted to the, towards the U.S. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the, the market, the international and the U.S. market, really have a nice diversifying factor to them. And so if I have 70% of my portfolio in U.S. Lar or, you know, U.S. stocks and U.S. tank, but international does great, I really didn't have enough exposure there to, to have my portfolio impacted. And you'll see that as we walk through the actual returns, because... For everybody who likes numbers, we've got 44 years of returns that are coming up here. 44 years oh, of yeah. returns coming oh, yeah. right up. All right, so you have some questions here that you pose um, as well for people to, to think about. Yeah, yeah. This, this is more for like a takeaway for clients, um, you know, something that they can write down on and have for later. Like if they forgot something, they can go back and look at what their answers were and understand what they were doing. So gotcha. it's an interactive guide. Interactive guide, okay, very cool. So here's some of those asset class mixes. Tell us what we're looking at here. So this is if we take international large, we take US large, we take the bond structure that those other the sample portfolio had and we weight those returns based on the actual market returns of those years. That's what the portfolio would have done based on that weighting. Okay. So what we're looking at is actual market returns modified to represent that client's portfolio. Okay. All right. So when we look at this and we just sort of go through the years, I guess it gives us <clears throat> where we can see a huge impact if you scroll back up to the top real quick. Okay. Where we can start to see a huge impact of where this where this plays out is the first part is asking the client, you know, we start with the 1973 and 1974 cuz those were negative years, right? And we start by asking the client you know, did you realize it was possible for your portfolio to produce that much of a negative? Because that's where people get into trouble. They think that they're conservative, they're actually aggressive, or their, their portfolio like shifts towards aggressive. They have a loss like that, they sell out, and they destroy their wealth. So it's the first piece. Is, uh, we had a friend, uh, friend from the South uh, call that the pucker factor. <laughs> He's like, so how does that sit with your pucker factor? And I'm like, what? What's that? I was like, what's a pucker factor? <laughs> like, You'll sounds, figure it out in a minute. Like, awesome. <laughs> right. This is incredible data, though. Yeah. Just to be able to look at s sort of how, if you properly set these up, you know, how these portfolios have been designed using this past data. The conservative one you see is, is and through this period, this 20 plus year period, is never down in a year, a per even a percent. Yep. So if that, if that tickles your fancy, yep. mm -hmm. then, you know, hey, I don't ever want to be down much. That's why the conservative portfolio is designed the way it is. Well, and then this is where you see how the fear that gets pushed by Wall Street is kind of unnecessary, right? I mean, even look at the, the aggressive portfolio, okay. right? Yeah. One, two, three down years. Three down years in a 20 year period. Yeah, 20 plus, this is like 23 years, I think. Yeah, so, so three down years. And you're but significantly that's what down. they're focusing on. Yeah, you're significantly down in those years, but look at how much you're up in some of these years. I mean. You're, you know, in 73 and 74, you're down 17 and 23%, but then immediately after that, look at the run. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So it's weird when you think of 
why Wall Street and why the industry pushes concern over these down years when the real teaching should be look at how many up years like yeah you're gonna have down years but man hold on this is a hundred years of data we have in total we got 44 years of it here but it's not a it's not a coincidence it, it happens where a down year is followed by multiple up years but we've been in some of those up years yeah. now for you know what since mm -hmm. 2009 we've been up Yep. So. And here's where it gets real fun. So this is where you can see the impact of diversification. Look at 1977. Look at the sample mix by comparison to conservative, moderate, growth, aggressive. Mm. You see how big of a differential that is? Yeah, you're losing a lot of money there. Yeah. And that's because small international and small U.S. did amazing in that year. But the portfolio on the left only has large. They missed out. Yep. And you can see that trend for a few years, in fact. 12% in 1978 versus 24% if we're looking at the growth. 12 again versus 16. 24, 22, negative one, seven, right? There's a trend of, of that kind of happening. And this is why we show this is like going back. If you believe that you can't predict markets, then you have to invest long term. If you have to invest long term, you have to diversify. But nobody really understands or has seen the impact of what diversification is. That actually showcases the so this impact. Will show you. So when I, when I get this report from you, this is going to show, I, my information is going to be in this green column. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's going to say, okay, based on what you're currently invested in, here's what, you would ha here's what would have happened to your portfolio during these years. Yep. And here's what happened to these academically designed portfolios. Yep. Okay. And we actually give the left column a lot of credit. I want to throw oh, that yeah. out there, number one, because we, we have three considerations there. Number one, that you don't ever change that allocation mix, right? And if you're working with an active manager, that allocation mix is changing every year, right? Number two is that even if you only owned one stock in the large U.S. marketplace, we're giving you the benefit of the whole market, which obviously wouldn't be the case if you only owned one stock. Mm. And then third, we're giving you the benefit that you never made a behavioral mistake, that you never sold when it was down, you never got greedy when it was up. You just you, held. You all, well, you always rebalanced, mm -hmm. meaning always you rebalanced. always sold low, or sold high, bought low. That's how, when that portfolio looks the way it does, it's assuming that you always did that. Gotcha. And so most people's portfolios are gonna end up being way riskier than that because they're not gonna do those three things. They may affect you the opposite, mm -hmm. cause more detriment. Most of the time, they do. So, okay, so yeah, so that's a that's probably. an incredible twenty three years worth of data to look at right there. This is priceless information, folks. I mean, just just crazy. Um, I do want to jump to a quick comment here before we look at some of these more recent years. Um, John says uh, the down years of the recession ended up helping me long term as I was consistently buying in each year and picking up shares at a bargain. Mm -hmm. Bingo. When things recovered, yep. the return was even higher. Bingo. on those shares. Exactly what you should do. Well, he, well, so what he was doing and what he's saying right there, that's, that's rebalancing. Mm -hmm. That is something, you know, looking at the market like you would retail. It's like, oh, 40%, you know, 40% drop, discount, right? 40% <laughs> increase, eh, maybe I'm not going to buy a lot right now. Right? <laughs> Nobody goes for like a Jaguar or a car, right? And they're like, well, we have a special for you today. It was 60,000 and now it's 80. Oh, well, crap. Let me buy it right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> Might go up again next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did that in San Diego real estate. Thank you, John, for the comment. We are live yes, here on thank Facebook. You. If you want to drop your comments, uh, if you have questions for Thomas and Chana, please let us know. But no, that, that's how real estate was handled in San Diego, uh, really in the early 2000s. If the, if the, the places didn't sell, they, wrote, they raised the prices. Like every month in some cases, especially downtown. When downtown mm -hmm. was just starting to get, like Peco Park was coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was like, okay, this condo is 800000 this week. Next week it's eight twenty five. The week after that it's eight fifty. And then eight seventy five. They literally did that. Wow. Which it's price is, fixing, it's illegal, we should let them know. Which is, <laughs> which is what built up such a big bubble. Yeah. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. It really, yeah, so it was crazy. But Okay, so now we're looking 1996 through 2017, yep. most recent completed calendar year. Mm -hmm. And we still have the sample client in green. Yep. And then we have the more conservative column on the left. Yep. Uh, all the way to the most aggressive column on the right of the blues. Yep. And this shows um, annualized return 
gross of fees uh, for the portfolio that we're looking at here today, the sample one, versus yep. the conservative yep. and all the way to the aggressive. And so usually what happens is people only look at that gross return. Mm -hmm. They never look at the column that's below it or the row that's below it, which is the standard deviation. Standard deviation, very simply explained, is the measure of volatility. So the higher the standard deviation, the more volatile the account's going to be. So that, those two numbers together is how you look at a portfolio to tell if it's efficient. And almost no advisor's doing that. So my thoughts are they either A, don't know, or B, the portfolios they're selling aren't very efficient, so they want to talk about it. <laughs> Both are very scary situations. Right. Yes. But you can see, right? So if we look at the annualized return on the green column versus the standard deviation, the annual return is between the conservative and the moderate portfolios, those first two while the standard deviation is between the moderate and the growth. So that means they're taking too much risk. For the return they're getting. For the return that they're getting. And you can see how it correlates. I mean, look at the, look at the conservative portfolio, that, that standard deviation of six about. And look at 2008. That correlates to a negative 3.47 return. Mm. By comparison, the 13.77 standard deviation of the sample portfolio, we go to 2008, negative 28. They correlate. It's not. It's not an accident, right? This isn't magic. There's an actual science to it. And and that's that's what happens. Wow. So if we look, we've been using the growth, which is that third column, right, F to compare the green column to. Look at the return compared to the standard deviation. What do you notice? Well, the return's higher. Standard deviation is also higher. Yep. But just by a little bit. So that all seems to make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what a client has, the, and you don't have to obviously, that's what's cool about portfolios, is you can find any range within that because all the, that's dictated by is the percentage of stocks. So the that percentage is a 75-25 stock. You know, I could go 70-30, or I could go 60-40, right? Or I could go 61-39, right? Like there's, you can do whatever combination you want. But what we want to do and what we're teaching here is for someone to realize that what's available to them is through diversification, I can either have a little bit more risk minutely and end up with 2% two like two, two more return. Or I can look at the returns and I can get something that's more return for about 40% less risk, that, that uh, mm. moderate column. Yeah, that would make that would seem to make the most sense yeah. for this person. Now, these are percentages, right? And so percentages, sometimes it's hard to connect. It's still conceptual when you're trying to connect a percentage. So we have the next page is actual dollar values. That's where, if I don't mind my saying, shit gets real. <laughs> um, so that $1 there is what that's indicative of, what we're representing is we're saying $1 is put into the market or $100,000 is put into the market represented by that $1 okay. in 1973, and that's it. You just put 100000 in, and you let it ride. Let no it ride adding. With these investments. Right. And so you can kind of see, right? Like, so in 1973, 1974, your 100000 would have gone down to 73. That's where people get scared. They freak out, and they sell out, right? But let's see if they didn't. Let's see if they held long term. They didn't try to gamble the market, and they were diversified and did what John said. They bought low, sold high. Scroll all the way down, just go all the way down to 2017 and see what would have happened. Dang. So this is crazy is that this is what's available to people. Wow. Like why do I need to pick and guess and choose individual stocks if this truly is available to me? That's bonkers. So the two percent didn't seem like it was a lot more on the growth side, but in dollar values. You put in a hundred thousand and seventy three and you got twenty three million on yep. the aggressive side? Yep. That's insane. And that's just based on the returns of the indexes, right? That's just based on what those call what those asset classes actually produced through history. Crazy. Yeah. This is humongous. Yep. Unbelievable. Really. And so you, you, this is, but so most people don't end up even giving the green column because their behavior kicks in, right? 
and they, they end up selling at the wrong time, they buy at the wrong time, they get talked into something that they think's gonna produce even more, like, you're getting 10%, I got something that's doing 20, right? And they abandon principles and they end up you know, getting screwed over. So most people don't end up with the left column to begin with. But if you have the discipline and you're taught the behaviors and you're taught the mindset, why end up with the green column when that one that we've been comparing it to is possible? Like why end up with 6.6 .6 when 15 million was what was possible with for almost the same risk? Mm. Or that middle column where you could have taken 40% less risk, had smaller move down movements in the market, less freakouts, and end up with eight <laughs> instead of 6.6 .6 with tons of risk. And we're talking about basically 44 years here worth of data. Yeah. So 44 years in the market, mm -hmm. which is probably pretty normal. Most people are probably in more longer than that. Bingo. That's what's crazy is when we talk about like when you're 30 years old and we're talking about, oh, you got 30 years. No, you don't. <laughs> you might have like 60 years to invest. Probably more. And that's what's possible. Holy smokes. <laughs> 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 and, and, and that's what, the reason we do this is because, you know, you were saying like people don't do things altruistically. That's true. We get paid for this, right? And we use it to invest ourselves. But with this knowledge, like it, it, with what we now know and what we're teaching, we're doing, first off, we're doing it ourselves. And secondly, we know like even if we didn't do this and we just worked nine to five or did a different occupation, we would produce those results because that's how we're investing. But we want to share it and teach it because in truth, if people and chose to do it as a business where we're paid for it because if people learn this not only can they produce the same results but imagine what impact you can have in your family and in your community and just the kind of person that you would be if you're not stressed about money and you're not stressed about can I get that future goal and it's now who can I give to I have too much. Uh, how can I support others? Like just the per just your being in that space is completely different. Yeah, to be able to crack the code of of what it is that you're you're teaching is taking back the American dream. Yeah, freedom. Mm -hmm. Like uh, here's here's a perfect example. It's a sad one, but it's a perfect example. We had a uh, we have a client we're working with right now. Her advisor had the model of gambling the market, so had you know. 20 stocks, was buying and selling them, like in 130 transactions last year based on their tax uh, report. And her account went from 780,000 in, in 2012 to uh, 480 today. So that way, right? Wow. The strategies we use have what's called GIPS audited returns. And what that is, is it's a, it's a global investment performance standards. It's a third party actuary that verifies that net of fees, these returns actually happen for clients. So we're like, well, we have our GIPS report. Let's just look at what the client would have produced from 2012 to 2018 with us. It was 780 growing to 1.2 million based on the GIPS report. So 1.2 million here was possible. 480 was what she had and that gap is the difference between dreams and goals and supporting a uh, family and supporting charities. Like that's, that's what people are screwing up when our industry is, is um, doing the shady stuff that it's doing. And that was with her taking an annual distribution. Wow. Oh yeah, that was, it was 780 with her taking 36,000 out. Yeah. This is mind boggling stuff. Um, I don't know. If if uh, you're interested in your financial future or not, um, but uh, <laughs> if you are, this is something to take a much closer look at. Um, Thomas, Sean, do you guys have anything you want to? Oh, I'm on camera again. That's okay. <laughs> do, do you have any closing words? Anything you'd like to, to part with for people who might be in that situation, not realize it, or you know, might be a trigger, something that's like, hey, if you notice this, if you heard this, if you own this, or something like that, something that might be a trigger for, hey, take a look at this. I would just say, don't be afraid to to look into it, like this is your future, you need to take control of it. Like we always say, we can't care more about your money than you do. Call your advisor, ask if they have Gibbs reporting. Like, just look into it, do your due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be complacent with yeah. it. I don't think you have to be where you are. Right. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, 
want be open to learning be a, be studious be you know we say something don't take our word for it we talk about nobel prize winning data in, in the markets go look it up like you know verify what we're saying too don't just go oh i like you know, this thomas guy he's <laughs> He's funny, and Shauna, you know, she looks good. <laughs> so I mean, the article's not going to look super sexy. It's not going to be like Tony Robbins' right. book, but you'll learn something if you read it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have uh, investments that you would like to have, you'd like to get a report like this based on your investments, um, then you can do that as well through Paradigm Shift Financial. We'll have that link posted uh, below so that you can check that out and get a report like this for yourself. Find out how much money could you be making. You know, how, how risky is your portfolio based on the returns that you're getting. I can tell you that exactly. And I think that's where people can really, really benefit yep. uh, immediately from this service and from finding out exactly what their investments look like. So thank you guys so much for coming in today and sharing this with us. Really yeah, appreciate your time. Us. It's great to see you guys. Thanks you are now us. officially smarter than everyone else. If you've watched it this far, you are smarter than everyone else. Make your friends smarter. Share this post. Give them the same opportunity you had. Thank you. Nice.